Greetings. So, we have the second lecture of the unit 5 and this will be on the Born approximations. Notice that uh, there is a plural s at the end because it is not just one approximation, but a series of approximations which is why it is referred to as a Born approximations. Now, before I get into this, I will like to remind you that I did brush, you know rush through several portions in the previous class in the last class. For example, when we wanted to estimate the asymptotic distance okay, and then I had a few slides with these blue arrows on the side and I just want to remind you that uh, there is very simple reorganization of terms okay, and there is no big physics or mathematics which is no trick which is involved in this. It is just rearrangement nothing else and as part of this technology enhanced learning NPTEL program, one advantage that I can take off uh, is that the PDF which has all of these details is available at the course web page. So, you can download it and go through all the intermediate steps which I have rushed through, but there is nothing very big about any of these steps, but they are all available in the PDF file at the course web page. So, we went through this to get an estimate of this e to the i k r by r which we have used in our previous class and then we put it into the Lippmann Schwinger equation and this is where we begin our discussion for today's class. So, the Lippmann Schwinger equation uh, had one difficulty uh, which is that it was it offered us a formal solution, but not a particularly useful one because of what I called as the catch 22 situation and I have explained the term catch 22, it has become commonly accepted in the uh, English language in the colloquial way because of this famous novel and there was this movie which was made on this and uh, some of you may have seen the movie um, that uh, you you I, I do not want to go into the story of the movie because that will take us much too away from uh, the discussion of the Bond approximations, uh, but it is a very nice story and uh, it, it argues that okay, there was somebody who said that okay, he needed uh, you know some waivers and he argued that he should get that waiver because uh, he was not uh, mentally uh, alert enough to take care of those situations. And then the uh, administration argued that if he is uh, in such a frame of mind that he can plan such a strategy, then he cannot have any issue and he would actually be mentally alert. So, that is the kind of situation that, that you try to pose a problem okay, or solve a problem, but then the solution and the problem become integral parts of each other and you there is no getting away from that. So, that is the what I call as a cash 22 situation. So, you have um, any any problem in physics you when you seek a solution and then you want to have an unknown left hand side which is to be described by an equation and on the right hand side it is necessary that everything on the right hand side is known and only in terms of that can you determine the left hand side ever. right? Now, how can you do that if the right hand side has the very same function which you have on the left hand side. So, this is the cash 22 situation we have to find some way of coming out of this. So, this is what the Bond approximations will help us to achieve. So, let us see how to go about doing that as a zeroth order solution what we propose is that we just put in the incident plane wave which we know Okay, there is nothing unknown about this and we plug it in over here. Now, this looks like ad hoc, but then there is some sort of merit to it because what it does to the right hand side is that you have the incident plane wave over here, but then it appears again over here, but in the second term it 
incorporates various things. What does it incorporate? It has got the potential. Okay, so that is the quantity of interest. It also has got the Green's function with appropriate boundary conditions. Right? So, there is some information which has gone into the second term regardless of the fact that you have made an approximation to that. So, this is just a start. This is not the end of it because you can always improve upon it. So, you can take it as an early solution and then make an effort to improve upon it. This is the kind of thing we do also in the Hartree Fock self consistent field method when you do not have a solution, you propose some sort of a solution and then iterate on it till you get convergence. Right? So, it is something of this kind. So, you propose this as the 0th order uh, solution and now everything on the right hand side is known because this solution is now replaced by this incident wave, incident plane wave and now everything on the right hand side is known. So, in terms of which you can actually evaluate the left hand side. So, that is the strategy of the Born approximation. Now, having done this, you can improve upon it because uh, this is our 0th order solution as uh, we just discussed, but then you can go further because you can go to the next higher order solution. If you take the first order solution. So, here the superscript is 0. So, watch it very carefully. Okay. So, the notation is that this is the 0th order solution which is nothing but the incident plane wave and now you go for the first order solution. This is the superscript 1 in which you put the 0th order term here okay. and now you can go further because in terms of this 0th order solution which you already know is the incident plane wave you can evaluate the first order term. And now you can put this first order term over here in place of this. So, the complete solution is psi superscript plus. Okay? That is the correct solution. We are approximating it now by psi superscript plus, but with the superscript 1 which was our first order correction. So, we pick the first order correction from here, put it over here and now again you have got a right hand side which is not perhaps the exact solution nevertheless it is better than what you started out with. Okay? And you can make subsequent you know um, approximations following essentially the same logic. So, you get the first order correction, the second order correction, you can get a third and fourth order correction and in general the nth order solution which is indicated by the superscript n will have the n minus 1th solution of the previous step which will be plugged in over here. Okay? So, that is the plan of this series of approximations which is why it is called as the bond approximations as a plural. So, that you have got a series of approximation and you can go to nth order, you can go to infinite order in principle. Right? So, the exact solution will require in infinite um, order, but then you can go as far as you need to and also as far as you possibly can depending on a given situation. So, let us have a look at the second order uh, solution. So, you have got the superscript 2 over here, the superscript 1 which is n minus 1 in this case right 2 minus 1 and this is your second order solution. Now, let us write it a little more fully because the first order solution itself had the 0th order term plus this correction. right? So, the first order term consisted of these two terms which I have now put in place of this explicitly. So, now you have got one term over here, a second term which is coming from this integration and then you have got this term and then a third term which will have um, two integrations one over r prime and the other over r double prime. So, each is a triple integral, but then there will be 3 plus 3, 6 integrations in the third term. So, in general, if you look at the nth order term, the potential itself like this is the second order term, sorry I let me go back. So, in the second order term, this is the second order term, the potential appears here and it also appears here. So, it appears twice okay? and for a weak potential, the powers as you 
have more and more powers of the potential, the subsequent terms in the Born approximation series will hopefully become smaller and smaller and that is what makes it possible to use this approximation in a very constructive manner. So, this is the general structure of the second order term. So, let us write these terms explicitly. So, these are the three terms. The first is nothing but the incident plane wave, second has got the potential once and the third term will have the potential twice, one is here and the second is here. Make sure that you have the appropriate dummy label of integration. Okay, an integration variable, it is a dummy label, it gets integrated out, but then it has to be appropriate for each integrand. Okay? So, uh, make sure that you do not uh, make any careless mistake about it. So, there are these three terms and let us now focus our attention on the integrands. What is it that you are integrating out? So, let us look at them and in this integrand, so let us look at the second term this we know this is the plane wave incident plane wave right and then the other part or the main essential part of the integrand is this g u right. So, that is like the heart of the integral because you have this term of course, it is a part of the integrand. The integrand you can think of the integrand as factored into this piece and then into this piece. So, this is what is in the blue box is then like the heart of the integral and it is often refer, referred to as the kernel of the integral. So, it is not just the integrand itself, but it is the main part of the integrand. So, you have identified the kernel in this term and then there is likewise in the third term, this is the one if you uh, uh, agree that okay, th th this is something that is known, we already know what it is and then the remaining part of the integration which really has got the heart of the integral or the kernel of the integral that is what is in this red box. Okay? So, let us write these terms clearly now. So, these are the three terms, we have identified the three kernels and these are written as k1 and k2. So, k1 kernel is this one g u k 2 is this g u g u. Okay? But then the argument of this u is r prime, the argument of this u is r double prime. So, you have to be very careful about that. Okay? So, this is the recognition of the essential core of the integrand which is the kernel and we now write this kernel which is uh, the one with subscript 1 has got the potential once and the one with subscript 2 has got the potential twice, once here and again over here. Okay? The arguments of the kernel again you have to be careful because this one will depend on r and r prime, this one will depend on r and r double prime, r single prime gets integrated out. Okay? So, that is the kernel that we will be using. So, uh, this is the second order term and you can now write the second order term as a sum of three parts, one is here, second is this integral and the third is this integral. So, these three pieces can be written as phi 0, phi 1 and phi 2 and then you can write the second order solution as a sum of these three terms phi 0 plus phi 1 plus phi 2. Okay? So, you can in the nth order solution, in the nth order solution you will have n terms and you can go to n plus 1 th order or even infinite order if you like. So, the nth order solution will be a sum of similar terms and now you know how to come up with these terms, how to come up with the next term. So, the n plus the nth term will uh, have uh, all of these terms n plus 1 terms phi m going from 0 to n. So, there will be m plus 1 terms over there right? and your solution is the one with superscript plus which will actually require you to go all the way to infinity. Okay? Uh, only then you will have the complete solution. So, that is the this procedure of getting an approximate solution to the scattering problem. 
using the Lippmann-Schrodinger equation and making an approximation appropriately depending on the powers of the potential. So, this is um, this whole scheme is called as a Born approximation and that will give you an approximate expression of the scattering amplitude. So, the scattering amplitude which we know is this integral okay, phi k f this is the final state momentum in the scattered state and this is the initial momentum and you need to evaluate this matrix element. So, here the superscript is plus, but you will be making an approximation to this. So, you can evaluate this matrix element and the corresponding scattering amplitude at various levels of approximation the, the uh, first order, the second order and so on. So, this is your complete expansion and if you put this term over here, your scattering amplitude will be a sum of a number of these matrix elements as you can see directly, right? because in this vector you will have n number of vectors for the nth order solution. So, you will have the first order solution. So, this is when you get a solution um, at this level where you have only the first power of u, you have a solution which you call as the first order Born approximation to the scattering problem. So, this is your first order Born approximation, then you have the second order Born approximation and then you have a sum of all these terms. So, the nth order scattering amplitude will be a sum of these n matrix elements okay? and these this is what you call as a Born series. So, this is after Max Born and uh, here I have written this f with a bar on top of it, but you can immediately see that so far as the first Born approximation is concerned it is already this. right? So, here in this if you look at the jth term in the scattering amplitude, then the potential u will appear j times and g 0 the Green's function will appear j minus 1 time. Okay? So, as you can see very clearly from this. So, this is what we have got and if we look at the nth order solution, so, this is the main story, but essentially the Born series is then a sum of these all these terms and you can represent them by diagrams. Notice that in the second order term the potential will appear twice. So, it is as if you have got a particle which is incident in this state, finally it gets out in this mo momentum k f which is the same as in over here. So, the final state momentum is always k f, but intermittently it can get multiply scattered. Okay? So, that is represented pictorially. So, as if the particle gets scattered in the scattering region, gets scattered by some other part in the source region again and then again and depending on how many times the potential term appears in the Born series, it gets multiply scattered. So, this essentially it is a multiple scattering series and you can represent this pictorially as well. So, these are the, um, the G 0 is of course, the Green's function or the propagator and let us now focus our attention on the first order Born approximation. So, here this delta is the momentum transfer, it is the difference between these two vectors the initial state momentum and the final state momentum. You can always write it uh, along with the h cross if you like. So, these are the k vectors and h cross k is the momentum. right? So, delta which is k i minus k f is the momentum transfer and this is the scattering amplitude in the first Born approximation. So, you will need to evaluate this integral and you can manipulate these terms because this is nothing but a plane wave uh, with momentum k f. This is the complex conjugate. So, this comes with a minus sign here and this one on the right comes with a plus sign and then you have the difference k i minus k f which is the momentum transfer. So, that this is the integral that you have to determine. Now, this looks like a very familiar expression. Okay? You can see what it is and it will already occur to you how to evaluate this. You can also write it in terms of the real potential because the difference between the reduced potential and the real potential was only in terms of this uh, m and h cross and so on. So, you can scale it appropriately 
write it in terms of this. What is your conclusion? That the scattering amplitude in the first Born approximation is essentially the Fourier transform of the potential, right? So that is a very useful and a very uh, powerful result. All you have to do is to, you, you, if you have some form of the potential in mind, put it over there, get its Fourier transform and that will give you the scattering amplitude. So this is the result in the first Born approximation. In the first Born approximation, the scattering amplitude is proportional to the Fourier transform of the potential. Now, Having done this, let us go ahead and see what it gives us for the scattering cross section. The differential cross section is nothing but the modulus square of the scattering amplitude. So, you can go ahead and get that. Okay. And notice that because it goes as the modulus square, if there was any sign involved in V, like an attractive potential would come with a minus sign and a repulsive potential will come with a plus sign. If there was any sign which you needed to worry about, the information about that sign would become irrelevant when you take the modulus square. Right? The result is that the differential cross section remains the same regardless of the potential being attractive or negative. It does not matter whether it is plus or minus, you get essentially the same result. So, this is a very interesting feature of the first Born approximation. So, here you have the Fourier transform uh, and this appears as a uh, volume integral. You can uh, simplify this integration because uh, you know that so far as the total cross section is concerned, it is a double integral, not a triple integral. It is the differential cross section is over all the angles and you can carry out this angle integration over the azimuthal angle and over the polar, or polar angle theta going from 0 to pi, azimuthal angle going from 0 to 2 pi and this is the differential cross section which is the modulus square of the scattering amplitude. So, this integration will give you the total cross section. You can always choose one uh, axis of symmetry which will give you a factor of 2 pi when you integrate over the isometal angle. Right? From symmetry you get that result directly and then you have got an angle dependent scattering amplitude which you will have to evaluate in this theta integral. So, if you have a spherically symmetric potential, then this integration which is a triple integral, right? the scattering amplitude is a triple integral. So, you have one integration over the axis of symmetry which gives you a factor of 2 pi. So, you have got this minus 1 over 4 pi here, one integration over the azimuthal angle around the axis of symmetry gives you a factor of 2 pi. Then you have integration over the remaining 2 degrees of freedom r going from 0 through infinity and theta going from 0 to pi. Okay? So, those are the 2 integrals that you now have to determine one of which is already determined in this 2 pi. So, this 2 pi and this 4 pi will give you a factor of 1 over 2 and with that 1 over 2 we write the scattering amplitude as minus half and then you have got a radial integral and a integration over the polar angle theta. Now, this looks like a integration that you have done uh, what do you call it like a jar times, right? So, <laughs> so, might as well put a new variable there like carry out the integration over cosine theta instead of theta and that makes it easy. So, I will not spend much time discussing this. So, you have got the integration for this new variable which is cosine theta going from minus 1 to plus 1 and then you carry out this integration. So, you get uh, put the limits, okay? you get this familiar form. So, this is the usual integration that you would have done so many times and now what do you get? You are left with a radial integral from 0 through infinity. The integration over theta has now been carried out. Okay? There is an r square here, there is a 1 over r here, so you get only one power of r, right? And everything else is now taken care of. You have, instead of using the exponential form, you have written it as a sinusoidal function. So, this is the integration that you have to carry out in the first Born approximation. 
the momentum transfer is h cross delta. This diagram you would have drawn a number of times in a number of different situations. Uh, I think most commonly in x-ray diffraction when you use this uh, eval uh, sphere kind of right. So, you have got the net momentum transfer um, which is k i minus k f. So, this is the difference vector and then you have got an isosceles triangle over here. So, here you have got a right angle triangle of which this side has got a magnitude of delta over 2, this side has got a magnitude of k which is the um, angle opposite to the 90 degrees to the right angle right and this the third side will be k times sin of half theta right. So, from this uh, Pythagoras theorem you can use that and what it gives you for delta or um, is this 2 k sin theta by 2 and you, you have the Pythagoras theorem which relates the squares of these sides. So, you get you get a relation for delta square or half delta square, but then if you differentiate that you will get a 2 delta d delta. So, using that you will get sin theta d theta equal to delta d delta over k square. What is the range of theta? Theta goes from 0 to pi and theta equal to 0 is forward scattering, theta equal to pi is backward scattering. So, the difference vector k will go from 0 to twice k right. So, the range of delta itself will be 0 to 2 k. So, if you carry out the integration instead of theta you carry it over k uh, you can transfer the integration. So, this is the eval sphere this is in three dimensions ok we have drawn the figure on a plane and this is now your total cross section in the Bond approximation the first Bond approximation and you need to evaluate this integral instead of integration over theta you can integrate over the momentum transfer delta which will have a minimum value of 0 corresponding to forward scattering and twice k corresponding to backward scattering right. So, you integrate from 0 to 2 k. All right. So, th these are our main results and now let us look at the high energy limit which is where the Bond approximation is very commonly used and um, everybody believes and uh, uh, rightly so for uh, um, most situations although there are some exceptions on which I will con comment later. Uh, if you now look at the high energy limit, now energy goes as quadratically with k right h cross square k square by 2 m is the energy. So, the high energy limit will be obtained by carrying out this integration with this limit k going to infinity. So, here you have this 2 pi over k square integration going from 0 through infinity. Now, what do you see? There is a 1 over k square here and 1 over k square as k tends to infinity will give you a 0. So, that is your result that the Bond approximation first Bond approximation cross section will in the limiting case if you go to high enough energies it will go to 0 um, uh, and, and the rate at which it will go to 0 is 1 over k square or 1 over energy. So, it will fall as 1 over e. So, this is your first Bond approximation scattering amplitude. Now, let us take the case of Coulomb potential, but in particular let us just take the case of the screen Coulomb potential and when you adjust when you tune the uh, screening parameter in the Yukawa potential or in the screen potential uh, screen Coulomb potential you can always take the limit and find what would be the value for the Coulomb potential itself ok. So, let us determine this for the screened Coulomb potential. So, this is the Yukawa type uh, screened Coulomb potential and you can write it in terms of this parameter alpha or it is inverse it is the same. So, you have the screen Coulomb potential and now you should immediately recognize that when you put this potential over here this will give you a real number right. There is nothing over here which has a chance of giving you anything imaginary, 
Now what happens to the optical theorem? Because in the optical theorem we discussed earlier in the previous set of classes that the scattering cross section uh, goes as the imaginary part of the forward scattering amplitude right and the imaginary part no matter what angle in this case actually goes to 0. So obviously you know that the optical theorem is not going to be valid at least in its form in the form in which we have established it in the case of the first Born approximation okay. So uh, we already expect that we will have difficulty with the optical theorem and now let us um, uh, get rid of this R. Now you have this expression for the first Born approximation uh, scattering amplitude. So you have to determine this integral now which is um, again you would have carried out integrations uh, of functions this is a product of two functions of this kind quite routinely it is easiest to do it if you put this in the exponential form and take the sum of two integrals that is much easier. So these are usual tricks and if you carry out this integration which you can work out very easily the result is that the first Born approximation scattering amplitude for the screened Coulomb potential goes as u0 over delta square plus alpha square. Now this is a very important result the differential cross section will go as the modulus square so you get u0 square and the square of this denominator okay. It is the same for the attractive and for the repulsive potential as we commented earlier okay. And now if you use these forms you plug in the explicit form of the scattering potential. So instead of the reduced potential you use the real potential and if this is some sort of a, a screened coulomb interaction between so th this is scattering between a charge z1 e times which, which is uh, being scattered or interacting with another charge z2 e then you will have this z1 z2 e square and then you will have the other terms in which we now find this h cross and m because we are using the real potential not just the reduced potential u. So we already uh, using that evolved construction we have shown that this delta is twice k sin theta by 2 right from that previous diagram uh, for the evolved construction and uh, delta square which comes over here in the denominator we can find it in terms of k square which we can write in terms of E and h cross square. So we can put all the terms together and write it in a form and you probably begin to recognize this result because it is very familiar it is something that you would have seen earlier and it comes as a surprise that you are you seem to be heading toward a classical result as you can see that you are heading toward that okay. So if you see this, um, this is a very interesting situation and um, the, I have just rewritten this um, uh, for this, this alpha is coming from the Yukawa potential this is the one which scales uh, the coulomb by the exponential term and instead of putting it in these m e and h cross and so on I write it in terms of these atomic unit for length which is a0. So in terms of a0 it is 4 z square for an electron proton scattering so z1 and z2 are, are both equal in this case so you get a factor of z square instead of z1 z2 okay and now you have this a0 square and you have this term here. Now this is the differential cross section you can integrate it to get the total cross section integrate over all the angles right. So integration over theta and phi and the range of integration will be for, z, for theta going from 0 to pi corresponding to the momentum transfer going from 0 to twice k. So this is the total cross section in the Born approximation and here is how it will behave okay. So first thing to note is that the total cross section at this energy is not 0 whereas the imaginary part of the 
forward scattering amplitude is 0. So, the optical theorem is uh, let down in the first Born approximation. Now, if you plot this, it gives us some interesting uh, characteristic features of the Born approximation. So, here is one. So, this is the differential cross section plotted in units of u0 square a4. So, that is just some scaling. So, do not worry too much about it. And here it is plotted as a function of the momentum transfer. Okay? And this is measured in terms of 1 over a. So, this is some sort of a range which is involved in, uh, in scaling down the Coulomb potential by the Yukawa factor. Okay? So, this is the this is how the differential cross section behaves in general. Now, let me show you another plot which is really very interesting which is here. Okay? Now, this is a similar plot, but it has been uh, here you see curves for different values of k. So, this is for k equal to 1, this is for k equal to 2, k equal to 3, k equal to 5 and so on. But what are you plotting? You are plotting a ratio. Okay? This is a ratio of the differential cross section in the first Born approximation at an arbitrary angle theta okay, that is in the numerator and what is in the denominator is the differential cross section in the first Born approximation not at an arbitrary angle, but in the forward scattering direction at theta equal to 0. Okay. So, this tells us to what extent scattering in other angles is important relative to scattering in the forward direction. So, this ratio what you are plotting is a measure of the importance of scattering in different directions compared to the scattering in the forward direction. And notice that here if you go to high energy, you know this is k equal to 1, k equal to 2, k equal to 3. So, as you go inward energy is increasing as you go in this direction and as you go to the high energy limit which is what we considered almost and this is plotted as a function of the angle theta. right? So, what you find is that almost all the scattering is in the forward direction because this ratio is equal to unity over here. Okay? So, at the high energy limit almost all the scattering is in the forward direction. So, forward direction means it will go in some small cone in the forward direction. right? So, you will have a direction of incidence and you will have a small measure of cone and that cone will become smaller and smaller as the energy increases or the range increases. So, you can expect it to go as 1 over k a some sort of an order of magnitude estimate for this angle. And if you uh, look at that, so this is the um, uh, result that you get that at high energies almost all the scattering is in the forward direction. Now, this angle is about is of the order of 1 over k a and this is the kind of cone in which most of the high energy scattering takes place. Now, this is a good result very useful one and you can see because delta is twice k sin theta by 2 this we know from the previous analysis of the eval diagram then delta over 2 k will be of the order of sin theta over 2 or right and theta over 2 for you know when this angle is small this sign of this angle is nearly equal to the angle itself which is of the order of 1 over k a. So, you get a factor of 1 over twice k a for delta over 2 k. right? So, you get 1 over twice k a over here and in the high energy burn approximation you get your this, this result we have seen earlier we have written it in terms of this more radius a 0 also and what we get is if you look at the limit alpha going to 0 or a goes to infinity which is when the Yukawa potential will go to the Coulomb potential. Right? So, as the Yukawa potential goes to the Coulomb potential this term alpha square vanishes and then you get the sin square theta by 2, but then you have got another power of 2 over here and that is essentially the classical result. Okay, in classical Rutherford scattering, okay, 
that is exactly the result that you get and this is rather exciting that the Bond approximation or um, uh, the, the Coulomb uh, potential obtained from the Yukawa potential by taking the limit of this alpha going to 0, you get you recover the classical Rutherford result. So, this is the problem with the optical theorem that we had noticed that the imaginary part of the forward scattering amplitude actually goes to 0. Okay. But then if you determine the scattering amplitude using this integration of the differential cross section, right? you do get a non-zero scattering amplitude. But then if you determine the Born approximation scattering amplitude in the second Born approximation, it turns out and I will not work that out in any detail over here, but then you do get the total cross section to be given by 4 pi over k times the imaginary part of the forward scattering amplitude, but in the second Born approximation. So, there is some sort of a non-linearity over here and this is sometimes referred to as a non-linear nature of the Born approximation or the Born series of approximations. And it is only with reference to what you expect from the optical theorem. And you can still write an expression which is somewhat similar to the Born approximation. Um, and you can uh, expand the scattering amplitude and the scattering cross section in different powers of the potential and then look at the corresponding powers of um, uh, if, if you make a comparison of corresponding powers, then you see that there is this non-linearity pops out of that. So, this is a straightforward extension which I will not discuss any further. The only thing I will like to remind you or make a comment on that one expects the Born approximation from all this discussion that it will work at high energy. And at high energy, then the particle comes at such immense energy that it sees the target potential, interacts with it, gets scattered off and there will be no effect of the electron correlations. Because if the target consists of many electrons, which it almost always does when you do atomic scattering, then you know very well that the single particle approximation does not describe the atom fully correctly right because it leaves out what does it leave out it leaves out the coulomb correlations so these coulomb correlations are left out and you do not expect these correlations to play any important role in high energy scattering because you think that okay it's going to come so fast that it will not be disturbed by the correlations which will be so weak and so insignificant that they won't matter in other words your uh, one would be tempted to conclude that in high energy the independent particle approximation and the Born approximation will always be valid and it is not a bad approximation as such it is not a bad conclusion in most situations it holds. However, there are certain uh, considerations due to which you cannot really get rid of the consequences of correlations. And as a matter of fact, it turns out that um, as has been discussed in this reference here, uh, that the independent particle approximation in um, X-ray photo emission, so that is high energy photo emission. In that, it turns out that it is all means, if it all the Born approximation works, it is almost always an exception and not quite a rule. And this is because of certain correlations that you really cannot completely get rid of. So, the independent particle approximation actually breaks down. So, one has to be concerned about some of these things. I can show you one of the results like if you were to look at the Born approximation result, you would expect this line over here, but this line is not what explains the experimental result which is well away from this Born approximation or independent particle approximation result and you have these additional features. So, this is just a comment for further studies and something that you might want to keep at the back of your mind. But other than that, for most applications, the Born approximation and the independent particle approximation is an excellent approximation in the high energy range. And um, with that, I will um, conclude this class over here. In the next class, I will discuss Coulomb scattering. Uh, 
you will remember that the methods that we discussed earlier were not directly applicable for the Coulomb case and it needed a different approach. So that is the one I will discuss in the next class. If there is any question for today, I will be happy to take.